probably the only person that has talked about new value investing or value investing version 3 and has formulated a philosophy on this. So the question is that many observers have been asking, value investing has not been performing for many, many years. Is value investing dead? And is it still applicable? Uh, there's an American firm by the name of AJO Partners. The CEO closed his company uh, towards the end of last year. It's a value investing firm. Uh, and they've been around for 30 years and they manage with an AUM of about 10 billion US dollars. Uh, he closed it down because he says that as a value investor, uh, there was nothing that he could invest. There was no undervalued stocks that he could find that he could invest for his clients. And because of that, he decided to close his firm. And he says that his philosophy was actually at odds with many forces driving the market. Even our good old friend, Mr. Buffett, has generated returns that have been inferior to the S&P 500 for many, many years. And in his long history of investing, this is the first time that it has ever happened. Uh, this is Berkshire Hathaway of uh, Warren Buffett versus the S&P 500. This is from 1999 up to 2020. Now, if you look, if you break this period into uh, two sub periods, one from 1999 up to 2008, which is a period of about 10 years, and then from 2009 to 2020, which is a period of 12 years, right? So the first period, 08 to, uh, sorry, 1999 to 08, in that 10-year period, Warren Buffett beat the S&P six times and he lost to the S&P four times. What is unique and what is distinctive about this period is if you look at from 09 up to 2020, out of the 12 year period, Warren Buffett beat S&P only four times. That means only about 30%. Twice, they were about equal very, very uh, similar returns. And what is most uh, educational and uh, surprising is that out of the 12 years, Warren Buffett lost to S&P six times, which is 50%. Uh, if you look at his long track record going back to the 50s and the 60s, Buffett has never lost to the market for such uh, for, for so many years in, in, uh, in a decade. Next. And in the last two years, 1999, uh, 2019, sorry, my, my mind is still stuck in the last century. 2019 and 2020, Berkshire Hathaway has also uh, underperformed the S&P 500 by a big, very big margin. The one in red is Berkshire Hathaway, the one in blue is S&P 500. Next. So last year, Berkshire Hathaway sold positions in JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, PNC Financial, M&T Bank, and sharply reduced his investments in Wells Fargo. Now, before that, Berkshire Hathaway have an interest in almost all the major US banks, except for Citigroup and Morgan Stanley. And when he sold last year, uh, before he started selling, he had about 60 million JP Morgan shares worth about 8 billion US dollars. By the end of 2020, he had zero JP Morgan shares. At the beginning of 2020, he had about 345 million Wells Fargo shares worth about 18 billion. By the end of last year, he just, Berkshire had only 52 million shares left. And Berkshire has been holding Wells Fargo for 30 years. And Buffett has always liked banks. Next. The other major thing that Warren Buffett uh, did wrong in 2020 was in April 2020, he sold all the investments that Berkshire Hathaway has in four major US airlines. At the end of 2019, December 2019, Berkshire Hathaway owned 10% of American Airlines, 
9.2% of Delta Airlines, 10.1% of Southwest Airlines, and 7.6% of United Airlines. These are major investments, major stakes. He bought them in 2016. And in April 2020, he sold every one of them. And as a whole, Berkshire Hathaway was a net seller in 2020 of about 8 billion US dollars, even though Berkshire Hathaway has about 130 billion US cash in last year. Next. Uh, this is the chart of uh, the two airlines, United Airlines and Delta Airlines. Uh, I hope I can use my mouse to point. This is April 2020. I hope you all can see. And this is April 2020. This was the time when Berkshire Hathaway sold all their investments in the US Airlines. Something has gone wrong. I mean, this is a person who has been a successful investor, not for years, but for decades. And he is the one who always advises, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. So this is very surprising. Next. Is value investing dead? Or is there new value investing? This brings us to the theme of this year's Budding Value Investor Award. What is new value investing in the context of the 21st century? So before I sketch out my new value investing, let me just run through the two main versions of value investing, starting with Ben Graham. Next. Uh, most of you would know him, right? But most would not know that he actually lost a lot of money in the Great Depression. And that experience convinced him of this concept, which I totally agree with, is margin of safety. So in 1934, uh, he published his book, an investment classic, is security analysis. People like Ben Graham, Buffett, they have got a lot of advice, a lot of famous quotations. But of all the quotations that I find the most relevant, the most valuable, the most precious from Ben Graham or even from Warren Buffett is this one that I put down in big, big, bold letters. Investing is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. That, I think, uh, is what has convinced me about value investing. It's what has been uh, a driver of my philosophy and I've been investing in the market since 1972, almost coming to 48 years. Uh, over the 48 years, I still find that this advice, this quotation from Benjamin Graham is one that you must stick it in front of your laptop, put it in your handphone, put it in your smartphone. And if you are an investor, remember it all the rest of your life. Next. Uh, his investment philosophy is simple. You know, he says, look, you look for companies trading less than the liquidation value of the assets, look at the financial statements, look at the tangible assets, and from there, determine what is the intrinsic value, which is justified by the assets of the firm, the earnings, the dividends, the financial strength. And then at the end of it, invest when you have a significant margin of safety. Uh, he has, I mean, over the years, Benjamin Graham has also modified his uh, value investing approach, he has modified his uh, criteria. If you look at the criteria originally in the Great Depression, they were super, super conservative. If you use that approach, you probably will not find a stock to invest until the next Great Depression. Then, in the 50s and the 60s, he modified them. Uh, now, this is one of his modifications. There are four main factors where it says the earnings yield must be twice the yield of the AAA bond, the dividend yield must be at least two-thirds of the triple AAA bond yield, uh, must have debt less than two-thirds of the tangible book value, the stock must have a PE based on his uh, definition, which is a 10-year earning of less than 16 times. So what this US firm has done is using this criteria and then uh, ran through the markets across the world and see what the results were like. Next. 
So this is what the firm found. This is in June 2017. The bar in red color, that's in November 2008. Across Europe, US, UK, Asia, and Japan, you could find stocks to buy based on Ben Graham's uh, very conservative uh, criteria. When you come to middle of 2017, that is about four years ago, there was not a single US stock that you could buy. And in the case of Europe, it almost disappeared. It was only in Japan that you could find maybe four or five stocks that would still meet Ben Graham's uh, value investing criteria. And that was four years ago. That was when the NY and NASDAQ were like 50% lower than where it is now. So something has gone wrong somewhere. Thanks. Then we have value investing version two. Uh, under this uh, version two, I will put Philip Fisher uh, as one of them. His famous book is Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. Please buy and read it because the 15 uh, guidelines that he put inside a, for readers to use in identifying a good investment are still as relevant as when the book was launched 50, 60 years ago. So he likes to concentrate, he likes to have his investment focused and concentrated on a few good investments. Next. Then, of course, Charlie Munger, good friend of Buffett. Uh, his investment philosophy was quite similar to Philip Fisher. And Philip Fisher and uh, Charlie Munger were the two main key influencers on Buffett other than Ben Graham. And it was Charlie Munger and Philip Fisher that sort of transformed Warren Buffett and not in an intentional manner, but subsequently created value investing version two. So the quote that I like from Munger, which is similar to Ben Graham is, all intelligent investing is value investing. In other words, you buy more than what you're paying for. And the part which is similar to Ben Graham is you must value the business in order to value the stock, which is similar, right? You must understand the business. You must be business-like. Then only you can invest intelligently. Next. Then, of course, uh, Mr. Buffett himself, right? So the thing that Buffett learned from Benjamin Graham is margin of safety. The thing that Buffett learned from Philip Fisher and Charlie Munger is the effect that a company's management can have on the value of a business and that diversification or naive diversification increases rather than reduces investment risk. So if you look at the diagram on the top right, uh, which is somewhere here, right, you have the value of shares, the intrinsic value here over time, and this is the share price. So this is where is you have the margin of safety and this is where you can buy. And you will notice there's a time period here. Now in the case of Ben Graham, he also emphasizes margin of safety, but his margin of safety was more at a point in time, very, very much more static. Whereas for Munger, uh, Philip Fisher and Buffett, the time factor, because as time goes by, if the company is well managed, the intrinsic value of the company would go up and you would still have a good margin of safety even though the share price might have gone up a lot. Thanks. So this is basically what Buffer says. Look at uh, individual companies and his valuation is based on owner's earnings, which I think most of you would have understood what it is. Uh, basically, it is profit or earnings that the company has generated which can be distributed to the shareholders. And he looks at long-term economics and he looks at intrinsic value, also always stressing margin of safety as the three most important words when it comes to investing. Thanks. So he, instead of looking at uh, US Steel or General Motors in the 1960s and 70s, Buffett was looking at Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, McDonald's. These are different from industrial companies. They have nothing to do with hard assets, but more with the company's brands. And then at the same time, you have the rise of the TV, the mass media, where these kind of companies were able to 
leverage on their brands in ways that a manufacturing company couldn't. And as they advertise more and more, you find that they set up, this company set up a virtual circle for their brands to remain dominant. So Buffett will find a superior business and pay a reasonable price. Whereas in the case of Graham would be to find a cheap stock. Whether the business is good or not, that's not so important. And the one thing that uh, you have to understand about value investing version two is this high probability insight. That means you must be able to see the future. The future is so predictable, it's so stable that you can more or less know what the earnings, the future earnings will be like. So that is one reason why Buffett is not able to invest in technology stocks because in that sector, you know, there's little certainty, uh, there's so much disruption, there's always uh, new products, new technologies coming in. So in that kind of situation, Buffett cannot have high probability insight and therefore he's unable to value technology stocks. Thanks. Value investing version three, or as I will call it, uh, new value investing. Let me just uh, have a sip of coffee. Okay, uh, like I said, if you were to go on the Google and do a search on what is new value investing, you'll be very disappointed because you would not be able to find anything. So, which is one reason why I explained at the beginning of my presentation that this year's competition is probably one of the most difficult. And to be a good value investor, you must have self-honesty and humility. Uh, you got to be the first person to criticize yourself. I find that to be uh, a factor which is very important, but very seldom talk about and very seldom emphasize. And value investing, the concept is simple, but to practice it successfully uh, is very difficult. As uh, I've shown you the recent experience of Buffett and some of the other value investors. Um, companies now trade persistently at above historic market valuations. It's not just a six month, a one year experience, it is multiple years. If you look at the global market since 09, uh, a lot of companies have traded at high valuations for the last 10 years. So you gotta ask yourself, what are the drivers of value in the current context? What constitutes value in the 21st century economy? What will drive business? economy and the market. So from my research, from my analysis, I find that macro factors are now part of value drivers and creators. Value investing is not dead. It is just that you got to adapt. Just like Warren Buffett, because if Warren Buffett had not adapted in 1960s and 70s and still stick to Ben Graham's method, he wouldn't have been able to find any good stocks to invest. It was because he adapted and created version two. That's why he succeeded. So now in the last 10 odd years, there is a new version three and I call it the new value investing. Thanks. Economy has become asset light. Yes, there's still a lot of asset, but a big chunk of it is asset light where the companies, the businesses do not need much tangible assets. Not too long ago, Exxon Mobile, PetroChina dominated. Now it is your tech companies, tech within quotation mark, your Apple, your Amazon, your Alphabet, your Alibaba, your Tesla. But these tech are not the same as the semiconductors and the uh, chip companies. These are different. These companies, the Teslas, the Apple, the Microsoft are more common. They're a lot more common with the consumer, durable consumer franchises of the post-war period, like the McDonald's, the Coca-Cola, and the Procter & Gamble. Next. Next. Can we have the next slide? 
And the 21st century is also a phase where we see digital platforms. And this is where, if you look at the history of uh, innovation, right, there are stages where innovation would have to go through each phase of innovation. You have one where the new, the first phase where the new technologies will erupt, they go through a speculative speculative bubble frenzy like in 1998, 1999, it goes past in 2000, 2001. And then in the early 21st century, it will settle down into a long period of stability from the 2000 to the 2008, 2010. And then you will find the new technologies, the innovation becoming mainstream. Next. So this digital platform, this digital businesses were one of the key uh, features that they benefit from network effects, right? Where uh, the, you go on a single, you go on the Alibaba platform, you go on Amazon platform, you find that uh, there are a lot of things that you can buy, there are a lot of uh, choices and you don't have to go to different shops, physical shops to look for, say, a variety of goods. All you have to do is to go to the platform. And the feature about this type of companies is that they are often characterized by this winner take all, or at least a winner takes the most kind of feature, where if you look at Amazon.com, uh, they dominate. Or in the case of Alibaba, they dominate so much that the Chinese government uh, not just Alibaba, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, JD.com have dominated so much that the government has to intervene and create a level playing field. So these uh, new businesses, these new digital businesses, the thing about the unique thing about them is that they need very little capital to grow, and they are fortunately or unfortunately key components of value investing version three. The business model are radically very different, but enormously valuable. So we immediately you think of Alibaba, Tesla, Amazon.com. Even though Tesla is not a di digital uh, platform, but the way Elon Musk has uh, structured his electric car company, it is becoming more or less like a digital business. Next. So you need in the past a huge amount of capital to achieve global scales. Now, these so-called tech companies can just write a few lines of codes and then you just press click send. That's it. You know, you get customers all over the world. And the other worrying thing is that these platform companies, these digital businesses are undermining the ecosystem that was created after World War II, that people like Warren Buffett, people like Charlie Munger are most familiar with. But now entire segments of the economy are being disrupted. And you've got not only to consider the new value investing, but also what are the stocks under the old value investing, which are vulnerable to this new type of uh, business models. Next. Next. What are the drivers of new value investing? In the past, whenever somebody asked Benjamin Graham what will happen to the economy or the markets, he would always say the future is uncertain. Basically, he's saying that he doesn't know. Unfortunately, in this 21st century, the world of new value investing, you have to know macro factors. You have to know the disruption from China. The disruption from China in the sense that China as the manufacturing center of the world has created huge amount of quality products at very affordable prices, lowering inflation all over the world. Disruption of technology type of many other types. The uh, example of Tesla electric car, it is not just a technology disruption, it's a, tech, it's a disruption at very different, uh, many different levels. Then the 2008 uh, global financial crisis which was created by US has led to a world where 
profit margin has been sustained at a high level for years and years because wages cannot grow because the economy recovery is so weak the economic conditions are so weak that wages are not able to rise faster than inflation and therefore companies are able to have good profit margin then you have because of the disruption from china because of the disruption from technology because of the 08 financial crisis a world pricing environment where there's hardly any inflation and to tackle this kind of macro conditions central banks all over the world with the exception of maybe china would have to pursue almost a zero interest rate for years and years and years so these are the new drivers of value creation of values thanks uh, this shows you the corporate uh, the corporate profit margin for america uh, 1990 to two, 2000 it was about 6 odd percent and then from 2000 to about 2009 was about 7 plus percent and then from 09 2010 to 2020 is about 9 plus percent and if you can see the high profit margin in america it's not just a cyclical phenomena. It looks like it is a circular trend. Next. Then the quantitative easing where the red line shows the uh, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve Bank, which has been going at a, at a very fast pace in line with the rise in S&P 500. Next. And then because of this high profitability of the US companies and because of tremendous amount of liquidity companies in the case of US have been engaging in tremendous share buyback tremendous amounts of share buyback so here I given you two hypothetical example where companies uh, experience very good growth in sales but no earnings the earnings could be like 10 years ahead and when you have this type of situation, how do you value a company, right? I mean, a very good example now is Razer. Razer is a gaming company from Singapore listed in Hong Kong. One billion over in sales just started to earn a little bit of earnings. How do you value such a company? And in this type of situation, the if you invest in this type of companies, like a long duration equity is like a long duration bonds. When you have a long duration bond, when you have a long term bonds, and when long-term interest rate rise, the value, the valuation of such companies will get whacked. So a long duration equity is one with very high PE ratio. Next. This is to summarize very quickly what the new value investing in the 60s and 70s, you have Procter & Gamble, you have Kodak, you have Gillette, you have Washington Post, Coca-Cola. There's pricing power where they increase the prices, they increase their sales and profit margin. They have to advertise, they have branding, they have a lot of tangible assets, high barriers to entry. Now you have Facebook, you have Google, Tesla, Alibaba, and so on. There's network effect, which wasn't present before. There's no need to advertise. I think most people don't realize that Google and people like Yahoo has never advertised at all in their entire history. They don't have to. And there's no pricing power. Their services, the price of services, the prices don't go up. A lot of intangible assets, low barriers to entry are actually very low. You could find another person. I mean, Yahoo was the first mover in the search engine world. Then Google came in and whacked Yahoo. This led to increases in demand for cloud computing, data center, laptops, smartphones, sensor, IoT, which all led to increase in demand for semiconductor devices. Next. So this diagram will summarize new value investing or value investing version three in the 20s you got us steel dupont general motors in 60s washington post coca-cola now google tesla under each business model you got to ask yourself how to create sales and if i were to create the sales how would the sales lead to earnings now once you have the sales and the earnings then how are you going to forecast them and how are you going to value them so what affects the business model, uh, the ones that we show on the right hand side, emergence of China, the pandemic, climate change, political change, and then the pricing environment, whether you're in inflationary world or disinflationary world.
Thanks. So does value investing version 3 work? Does new value investing work? Now, this is our Australian fund, our high capital international value fund. I take two periods. On the left here, we're in black. You'll see our return from January 2019 to January 2020 was about 5%. We were way behind the MSCI All Country World Index and way behind the ASX 200. Then we changed our, adopted our new value investing, value investing version 3 from January 2020 to January 2021. The results are almost, the difference is day and night. This is our Australia fund. This is the benchmark. We are very close to the benchmark and we have outperformed the ASX 200. Now you look at this period and this period, the contrast is, is, is huge. And we started buying Buffett sold airlines in April 2020. I bought AirAsia shares in April 2020. And our funds, the funds that we managed throughout all the period, we had very low cash. And instead of a net seller, we were actually net buying. So the results are beginning to show it is still in the early stages. But I think uh, I'm beginning to see, because in 2016, 2017, I was also like uh, some of the value investors. We had a lot of cash. We had 60%, 70% of our assets in cash. And the results, we suffered, as you can see in this black diagram here. But I've done my research. I've gone through many years of soul searching, uh, very deep research, and realized that, look, there is value investing version number three. Thanks. Very quickly, if you look at this company, year one, sales of 16 million US dollars by the time and making losses, by the time it gets to year eight, it was the sales went up to five billion over dollars and making very slight profit, 35 million US dollars. Now, in that first eight years, how do you value such a company? What does the company do? Thanks. Company B, 02 to 2012. Pre-tax in red, blue is revenue going up very nicely. Next. And the prospects of the company, of company B, they were very confident. They're confident that their customers and business partners will continue to stay with them. And they call it exciting times for the group based on their 2012 annual report. Next. And this is after 2012. The sales peaked and started to plunge and the earnings have declined to, well, almost lost position. Thanks. This is the share price of company B. Uh, it went to a low of about 20 cents. In 2010, it was about three ringgit. So you have lost about 280 or about 95%. You've lo you lost all your pens. Thanks. And this is company A. This is the first eight, 10 years of company A. Right, the share price was volatile. This was its IPO. It shot up and then plunged 95% and then went up and down and down. And then this company A up to date. This is uh, the first 10 years. The share price was about less than $50, $20 US. The share price now is about 3,000 over US dollars. Thanks. Hey, sorry, can you go back? Company A is Amazon.com. Company B is Star Media, our owner of our Star newspaper. So here you have two very clear examples of how do you apply value investing in the case of Star and in the case of uh, Amazon.com. Thanks. That will sort of uh, conclude my introduction to this new value investing or Value Investing version 3. Uh, if you want to learn more, I mean, you can always uh, subscribe to our newsletter, www.icapital.biz, or whenever we have talks like that, please uh, feel free to welcome and uh, take part. Thank you. Thank you, Tingbu, for the very insightful speech. Now, before we move on, 
uh, if you can look at your chat box, our customer support team have actually uh, uploaded a disclaimer statement. So if you could take some time to read the disclaimer statement, we would really appreciate it. Now, without further ado, let us begin with our finalist presentation with the first team of the day, which is Team Games of Well from Herald Ward University, Malaysia. Hi, Teams Games of Well. Okay, and they will be sharing their presentation on Ping An Insurance Group of China. Team Games of Wealth, you may start screen sharing and begin your presentation. That would give me time to sit down. <laughs> In games of health, you may start whenever. <clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. So today we'll be pre uh, presenting our recommendations by shares of Pingan Insurance. I'm starting off with an introduction to Pingan by On. Hi, everyone. Pingan is the second largest insurer in China and also a Fortune 500 company. Let's look at the pie chart. Pingan is more than just an insurance company. It provides a wide range of financial products and services, while their technology segment focuses on digitalization and creation of online ecosystems. All its business are powered by technology. Therefore, we can say that technology is deeply embedded in Pingan. Pingan's cross-selling business model is enabled with the Pingan ecosystem. The Pingan ecosystem consists of five elements, real estate, automotive, finance, smart city, and healthcare. These five elements come together and form Pingan's banking, insurance, and wealth management business. Mainly, insurance remains as Pingan's biggest business and focus. So value investors in the 21st century should always look for companies that have economic modes as they provide value and competitive advantage to protect long-term market share. And this can be seen with the Pingan ecosystem. Combined with their early moving heavy investment in R&D, technologies such as AI and blockchain can help reduce operational risk and also costs, which will ultimately allow Pingan to offer better prices and services to its policyholders. Thus, this protects Pingan against adverse selection from its competitors. Besides that, the strong brand premium of Pingan means that they have a large existing customer base, which can utilize network effect to grow even bigger. Besides that, there are very few competitors in the insurance industry in China, as the government imposes strict legal requirements and regulations before a company can start selling. Thus, this lessens the threat of new entrants. It is no surprise that Pingan is the largest insurer in tier 1 cities in China. We see massive potential in Pingan's intangible asset. Using online channels, Pingan is a high growth opportunity. However, as intangible assets such as technology cannot be seen or touched, the value of technology is hard to quantify. This should probably lead to disagreements in valuations as different investors have different valuation methods. Fortunately for Pingan, the interest in intellectual property is growing among investors as investors are starting to see the value of intangible assets. From the picture, we can see that all Pingan's technology companies have gone past the inception stage, which means their technology can work in the real world as a proof of concept is established. AI is one of Pingan's secret sauce. Pingan's AI doctor is able to diagnose the patient in one minute, and with this technology, long queues in clinics and hospitals will soon be a thing of the past. Pingan also uses AI to process road accident claims. Pingan's AI automates the whole claims process from reporting to payment in just 5 to 10 minutes. So, environmental, social and governance factors are used to evaluate companies on how committed and far they are with sustainability. Uh, a value investor in the 21st century should not disregard this. The importance of this can be seen with ESG funds performing stronger than non-ESG funds during COVID-19. Pingan bases their ESG on three pillars which are social good by combining technology with healthcare, sustainable products such as sustainable insurance, and impact investing with their poverty alleviation programs in China. 
Good management should not be disregarded by a value investor. Pingan has been steadily increasing their sustainability year on year, and recently it was upgraded to an A rating in 2020, which shows their commitment to a sustainable long-term value business. My friend Ivan will provide the valuations. So Pingan has good profitability. The combined ratio is a metric used to measure how efficient an insurance company is. A value of lower than one would be good, and Pingan has displayed consistent value of that. Pingan's earning per share in the last five years has also grown, so there is a high potential for growth as well in the future. Despite their high debt, Pingan has very strong solvency. The Chinese government requires insurance companies to have a core solvency margin ratio of above 50% and comprehensive solvency margin ratio of above 100%. Both the property and health insurance satisfy this by a big margin. The banking side of Pingan has also satisfied its capital adequacy ratio requirement, indicating a sustainable capital management. Pingan's total net premium has increased steadily over the past five years, so their business is continuing to grow. For our valuation, we use a Graham modified value formula to value the stocks. Our result is that we found using this formula, we found a fair value of 113, while the traded stock price at the time is 86. So there is roughly a 31% margin of safety. Next, there are several trends that support Ping An. First is China growing aging population, meaning that life insurance have potential to grow in customer base. The growing economy in the Chinese also shows that their upper middle class population are increasing. So there will be an increased demand for life insurance in the future. Ping An Life has developed technologies and have business lines that have synergy with life insurance, such as their good doctor program. The risk of this company is its high amount of debt. However, as earlier stated, their solvency is very strong. Compared to other local Chinese insurance company, Ping An has a PE ratio of 10.27, and it also provides an attractive dividend yield payout. As a conclusion, we believe that Ping An stock is undervalued, and it is an attractive investment option. Why invest in Ping An? By investing in Ping An, investors will reap the benefits of diversification, especially in an emerging market, which is important to a portfolio. Secondly, it can be seen with Ping An that it has strong fundamentals, and also its strong performance in its core insurance business will allow them more resources to conduct continuous R&D to widen their economic mode. And lastly, intangible assets are the source of creation of value, especially in the 21st century. Ping An's intangible assets have massive potential to compete in a world that is moving towards virtualization. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you, team Games of Wealth. Now, uh, let's proceed with the Q&A. Judges, you may begin asking questions. You start with. Yeah. Start with. <laughs> okay. Um, as uh, when you all were doing the research, did you all talk to the management of uh, Ping An or anyone else? Um, no, we did not. Okay. The EPS that you use, uh, this is just a clarification of 841. I can't seem to get an EPS from the annual report of Ping An. I I'm not sure where you got the figure from. Actually, we did find it in the, there was in the report. Yeah, the, the figure is different from the 841 that you all put in. Never mind, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. It's all right. I just wanted to clarify uh, where the figure came from. Uh, you have a capital adequacy ratio, which is a requirement by the government, 10.5%. The capital adequacy ratio is 13.96%. It's not much, uh, I mean, buffer or uh, much ab above from the 10.5% by the government. Is that, is that a good criteria for, for investing? That means it's just, just above, I mean, barely above la, the capital adequacy. 
Uh, so actually the capital adequacy is for one of their business line, which is the banking. It it's is banking and capital part. adequacy. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that is the banking. So it's not the insurance part? Yeah, the insurance, we check the core solvency margin ratio, which is far above it. Even then, it's quite thin margin because uh, I think in Malaysia, Benegara's uh, capital adequacy is very much uh, the banking sector's capital is very much above the Benegara. I, I don't know, probably about two times or one, at least 50% more. So this is, uh, there is some risk there. Huh? Secondly, I just want to ask you, mentioned in your first part, market efficiency, pharma study in 1992. Right? What is pharma's uh, the, the definition of market efficiency today compared to 20 years ago? Is it very efficient? Is it or semi-efficient or? Um, sorry, could you rephrase the question? You mentioned in your opening uh, about study by Pharma on market efficiency, page six. A study mm -hmm. by Eugene Pharma, 1992, found that low price to book and blah blah blah. So, having said that, value investing has lagged behind the market. I just want to know what is the level of efficiency is pharma's uh, view today? In 1992, when, when he, he did the study. Is it very efficient? What kind of efficiency? I'll say it's becoming increasingly efficient, especially with um, the flow of data um, especially in the 21st century. And I think that with um, new applications such as uh, Robinhood, it really democratized the markets. And this was why um, investor sentiments are also changing as they are seeking higher returns for a shorter horizon. So, um, but in terms of efficiency, I would say uh, getting more efficient. Um, because of the flow of data, okay. stock prices updated instantly, and which um, I would say allowing more uh, faster time to see discrepancies in prices. So, okay. but of course there will always be uh, chances to uh, ex like I wouldn't say exploit, but see discrepancies, but with the flow of data in the 21st century, I would say it's really efficient. So with very efficient market in terms of data, then how could value, how, how, where do you find value? I mean, it's not, it's not easy to find value when everybody knows what's happening, right? So what, what major tools would you use to look for value investments or undervalued stocks? I always say just never to forget the fundamentals. Mm. So you will always, always dig down deep to the fundamentals. And that's where you can find value. And I would say with the flow of data right now, mm. investors are quick to make decisions, maybe reckless or what. But by evaluating your fundamentals, you look at the cash flows of the company. Uh, look how positive it is. Is it borrowing in excess? Uh, operating profits. These, all these little things, good management, and especially intangible assets. Um, I know they are hard to quantify in a spreadsheet, but a uh, 21st century value investor should always account for this as well. And so your choice, so, so your choice of pick and is basically based on intangible assets and our growth. Yes, we see massive potential for Pingan to grow. Okay. Hey, can I just uh, take you all back to your submission, your submission paper, page 19, where you talk about valuation. Uh, you say that we believe that Pingan should be valued more like a technology company rather than an insurance company. Uh, but yet, the model that you choose, the valuation model that you choose is Graham modified value. 
So how does that valuation model fit in with a technology company? Because I, I don't see any technology part of the business being value in the Graham's model. Hey, um, in the first Ivan. place, yeah, go on, go on. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, what, what were you saying? No, go on, go on. Go on. Um, so, of course, we use Graham mod Graham's modified ver fair value formula. Um, but as we said, um, to evaluate a technology company, it's hard to quantify their their growth and their intangible assets. So, um, we still use Graham's modified fair value formula, but we also took into account their prospects as well. So. I would say that it still uh, gives a good indication with uh, Graham's fair, fair value formula. So I would also want to add that uh, Pingan is 70% on its insurance and a lot of its current research on the technology serve as a booster for their main business line, the banking and the insurance. That's why we choose to use the Benjamin Graham formula. Uh, Songwei, do you have any? Thank you, team. Games of Well looks like time is up. Um, so we will have to proceed to the second team. Regardless, well done. And thank you, judges, for the questions. Now, let us call upon the second team of the day. Team Capital Equity from University of Philippines, Diliman. Unfortunately, one of their team members couldn't make it to the presentation today due to health reasons. Regardless, we will invite the other two team members up to present their research on Jollibee Food Corporation. Team Capital Equity, you may begin screen sharing and begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, I'll start. Once a leading fast food company in just the Philippines, and now the largest Asian food chain in the world, we present Jollibee Foods Corporation, the company behind Jollibee, Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, Smash Burger, Highlands Coffee, and more. With close to 6,000 limited service restaurants and cafes across 18 brands in 37 countries, JFC aims to be one of the world's top five food service companies. Good morning. We are Capital Equity and we issue a hold recommendation on JFC with a fair value of 210 pesos, a 9.3% upside from its last close of 192.5. We believe that JFC remains a sound value investment in light of the growth potential presented by its dominant market leadership that primes it to capture Philippine consumption growth, its expansion of strategic foreign acquisitions to fuel its international business, and its extensive business transformation to improve profitability. We note, however, that the market is fairly pricing in doubts as to the pace of JFC's recovery from the pandemic and the turnaround of its loss-making acquisitions. But with a portfolio of well-off brands, capable management, and financial health, we remain confident that JFC will sustainably capitalize on long-term growth prospects and bring value to investors holding it. Starting off from home, we see great potential in the consumption-driven Philippines, where private consumption comprises 73% of GDP while growing strongly the pre-COVID CAGR of 6.6%. Alongside a young population, the country is seeing an emerging middle class, rising incomes, and rapid urbanization. As the economy recovers from the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, these create strong socioeconomic tailwinds for the limited service restaurant or LSR industry. But despite such robust demand drivers, the Philippine LSR market remains heavily underpenetrated, with each outlet serving 5,800 people far above the Asia-Pacific and world averages of 1,600. JFC, as the unquestionably dominant player with a market share of 49%, is strongly positioned to capture this growing demand. Its management recognizes this opportunity and has set 70% of planned local store openings in the country's more underpenetrated Visayas and Mindanao regions, which house 45% of the population, but only 6% of the company's local store network. However, with the pandemic causing revenues to fall 28% and wiping out two years of growth, 
We remain cautious in the near term as the Philippines faces a new wave of infections and lags behind other countries' economic recovery and vaccination efforts. But, but opportunities is not limited not- to the Philippines. GFC's international expansion is a key lever to its long-term growth. 80% of its planned 450 store openings for 2021 are set abroad in pursuit of its 10-year target 30 to 70 local to foreign sales mix. To capture foreign markets, JFC takes a two-pronged approach. For its Filipino brands, it strategically expands to locations with many overseas Filipinos, drawing on its brand equity as a reminder of home. It then crosses over to serving locals with localized product offerings. At the same time, JFC has actively acquired foreign chains with established brands and then built upon them to improve, deliver improved performance. We highlight Highlands Coffee in Vietnam, which has achieved market leadership and profitability under JFC's management. It captured the hearts of locals by serving their preferred Robusta coffee, setting affordable price points, and quickly adapting to trends by offering products like bubble tea. However, JFC's aggressive m and expansion has not come without challenges. Leverage has run up from 0.2 times net debt to assets in 2017 to 0.4 times in 2020, and the loss-making subsidiaries it acquired at the bargain, like CBTL and Smashburger, have dragged down margins. Coupled with the pandemic, JFC recorded its first net loss in three decades this 2020. Despite this, JFC's qualified management is not without response. It has implemented a 7 billion peso business transformation program, rationalizing its store network, setting up cloud kitchens, and improving online delivery infrastructure to eliminate unnecessary costs and build new drivers of revenue. We also highlight management's track record in turning around loss-making brands, which we expect to be replicated with Smashburger and CBTL. For Smashburger, JFC has reduced prices, relocated stores, and improved its menu to deliver sustainable sales growth. Meanwhile, for CBTL, it aims to simplify the franchising process and achieve supply chain efficiencies by relocating its costly American plant to Southeast Asia. While we are cautious about management's optimistic one-year guidance for the turnaround of these brands, we expect them to succeed in the medium term. We conducted a discounted free cash flow to firm valuation supported by forward EV EBITDA and PE relative valuations to arrive at a fair value of 210 pesos. We forecasted revenues for each of JFC's five key groups of brands by estimating net store openings and same store sales growth based on management guidance, industry growth, and comparable companies. This yielded total revenue CAGR of 13%. We also expect an EBITDA margin expansion of 2.1 percentage points from pre-COVID levels on account of its business transformation and the turnaround of CBTL and Smashburger. Our valuation uses a WAC of 8.7% and a terminal growth rate of 4.2% based on a revenue-weighted average of long-run GDP growth in key regions JFC operates in. To support our DCF, we also conducted relative valuations with a peer group of comparable LSR and cafe food service companies in emerging markets in North America. We see that while JFC trades at a seemingly expensive two-year forward PE of 34 times, its PE is still well within its historical 21% premium over peers. We find this premium justified by its historically consistent double-digit ROE and revenue growth and continue to believe that JFC is reasonably valued. In conclusion, we reiterate our hold recommendation on Jollibee Foods Corporation with a fair value of 210 pesos and an upside of 9.3%. By traditional measures, JFC is no value stock with a forward PE of 34 times in the face of a potentially subdued industry recovery and acquisition turnarounds that have yet to fully materialize. Nonetheless, the runway for growth remains long in light of JFC's dominance in the underpenetrated Philippine market, its continued global expansion, and its sound business transformation plan to expand margins. Coupled with its well-loved portfolio of brands and an ambitious and capable management, we see JFC as a valuable investment <laughs> worth holding on to. Thank you, and we are now open for your questions. Hey, thank you so much, Team uh, Capital Equity 3. So right now, we will proceed with Q&A session. Judges, you may begin. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, and I hope your click gets well fast. I have three questions. First thing is in your submission, in your full submission, you state in page one, you state that uh, new value investing, the shift to growth investing, and then you conclude the paragraph, it says that today 
market our performance is slowly shifting from value stocks to growth stocks. Um, so are you saying that value investing is dead and therefore it is now growth investing? Uh, no, so we don't think that value investing is dead. It's just that um, there's also been a shift in the way that value is, um, is looked at by investors and that um, growth and value are not mutually exclusive ideas. Even value, you can find value in things that are growing and um, you can also find growth in things that are valuable. So we don't think that these are mutually exclusive things and we believe that there should be um, a balance and what we're, where we see value and growth, I guess, intersecting is where is the extent to which growth has been priced in and the extent to which growth um, can be justified by um, both internal and external factors relevant to the subject company. Okay, my second question is on your valuation methods, uh, which in your full submission is in page 13, 14, and uh, 15. If I, I just, just a clarification. Sure. So you got, you got one main method and two supporting valuation methods. Your first one would be your free cash flow to firm valuation method, right? Yes. Yes. And then you use a one year forward enterprise value over a BIDA and a two year forward uh, PE relative valuation. Yes. So the main one would be the free cash flow to firm valuation methodology. Yes. And then if your fair value is uh, 210, and then the price now is only 192 with a 9.3% upside, why do you put a hole instead of a buy? Um, so the reason behind that is that at a 9.3% upside, while we think it's, it's a healthy um, gain for investors if they hold on to the stock, we don't see a very significant margin of safety at this price level, which is why we are currently um, a hold on, the rec on, on our recommendation, especially in line with um, the current risk that a firm is facing. Okay, and then if I can take you to page 37 of your full submission under your WACC, your weighted average cost of capital, uh, you put out there your pre-tax cost of debt is 4.99% for both initial and terminal, right? And yes. you methodology you use the NYU Stern synthetic spread. Why why yes. did you use the NYU uh, synthetic spreads? Um so the reason, the reason for the choice? Oh, so the reason behind that is that we wanted our cost of debt to be more forward looking. So rather than a historical cost of debt, we wanted to look at how much it would be to, for Jollibee to raise debt at the current, um, with the current um, market and current, um, I guess, situation that the firm is in. So we wanted a more forward looking as well as, uh, I guess, less um, historical biased approach. So NYU Houston was the only one that was available? Um, yes. So aside from that, um, another thing that we used as a benchmark was um, the yield on its current 10-year um, bond issuance, on its most recent 10-year bond issuance, which was, um, if I'm not mistaken, around six, six months to a year ago. And we looked at that and the spread over, it's the average spread over the risk-free rate and found it to be comparable. So we thought it would be a good um, measure. Okay, uh, because I, I don't know whether I checked the same source as you did, uh, because for the non-financial service firms where the market cap is more than 5 billion US dollars, and this data is at January, 2021, where the interest coverage is three to 4.25 times. Your interest coverage is 3.54. So the table I'm looking at is three to 4.25, which is in that range, right? Uh, the rating is uh, A3 or A minus, and the spread is only 1.33%. So if the spread is 1.33%, how do you get the pre-tax cost of debt as 4.99%? 
Um, I think that um, on a dollar basis, Jollibee's market cap is a little below $5 billion. Okay, can you repeat that? I think that on a dollar basis, um, Jollibee's market cap is a little below $5 billion. Yeah, so yeah. the applicable yield that we found was 2%. I mean, the two applicable spread rather was 2%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you go down, then it's about uh, about 2.3, 2.4%. But how do you still get your cost of debt at 4.99%? Um, so the risk, the, that's a synthetic spread. So right now, risk-free rates, well, back when we did our valuation, risk-free rates were at 2.99%. Um, so um, the risk-free rate plus the spread of 2% yields a 4.99%. Um, pre-tax cost of debt. Okay, all right. Uh, pass over to you. Besides uh, not much margin of safety, there's also an issue of uh, risk factors that you highlighted. Um, operational risk and uh, uh, industry risk and market risk. So mm -hmm. your recommendation of a whole, I'm just wondering whether we, sh we should uh, hold until when, when do you really buy? At what level? At what price? At what PE? Okay. Um, thank you for that question. So yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, definitely, there are still other risks that they're facing. So um, as mentioned earlier, the pandemic has wiped out two years of growth and Jollibee will have to um, take some time to recover for this. At the same time, um, there's also the issue of the turnaround of its loss-making acquisitions. So while there has been progress, this has been delayed from management targets in part because of the pandemic, but also um, in part due to internal challenges. So while we are seeing um, optimistic signs and the management has disclosed that um, the operating margins and the operating losses have significantly been reduced versus a year ago, um, this still hasn't fully materialized, so we remain cautious in that operational regard. So in regards to um, your question on at what level would we buy, I think that um, Are you actually- Are uh, So sorry, time is up now. Unfortunately, you have oh. to uh, end this Q&A session. Regardless, it was, uh, you, you guys did a really good job. And thank you judges for the questions. Now we would like to um, invite the next team of the day, which is Team Stella from Tunku Abdul Rahman University College. She will be presenting her research on SKP resources Baha'i. So Team Stella, hello. Uh, you may begin sharing your slides and begin your presentations when you're ready. Good morning to everyone. I'm Stella from Thai UC. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure most of you have seen or used these products, such as vacuum cleaner, hair dryer, and smart TV, which are produced by world renowned brands such as Dyson, Panasonic, and Sony. However, ladies and gentlemen, most of us do not know that all these branded products have one thing in common. They have components produced by a local Malaysian company, and the company is none other than SKP Resources. SKP is one of the largest homegrown EMS providers in Malaysia. Its business include manufacture of plastic components, tool and die fabrication, plastic injection molding, and PCB assembly. In selecting SKP, value investing model that have evolved over the past decades were employed. SKP meets the criteria of an undervalued stock due to its low visibility and its growth potential. The introduction of new revenue streams is likely to increase its value, therefore fulfilling the margin of safety principle. Its strong fundamentals suggest that it is a high quality company, which is a core pillar in value investing. 
A buy call is recommended on SKP with a target price of two ringgit and fifty-four cents, representing an upside of twenty-eight point three percent. The buy recommendation is based on the following reasons. The financial positions remain healthy even during the pandemic outbreak. A strong growth of 24% for SKP net profit is expected due to the promising outlook on the back of new orders with high margins. The continued support, to, the continued support of its key existing customers will continue to generate more revenue for the company. Freight diversion as a result of US and China trade war has also contributed to the strong orders from its existing customers. SKP invested 100 million in FY 2020 to cater both its EMS and non-EMS segments to create new revenue streams. After rolling out its first in-house PCB assembly line recently, its battery pack assembly is targeted to be launched in FY21. The pandemic outbreak has resulted the GDP of Malaysia in the second quarter of 2020 to register a negative of 17%. However, in the third quarter, the GDP had rebounded and recorded a negative of only 2.7%. This better performance was mainly contributed by the manufacturing sector. It is expected that EMS industry will experience a fast V-shaped recovery compared to other sectors which are likely to undergo a slow U-shaped recovery. Malaysia's annual household growth rate is around 3.2%. In 2019, it has reached 8 million households. The global households are expected to also grow rapidly, resulting in more demands in EMS industry for EMS products. Over the last decade, the demand for end products has increased due mainly to improved standards of living and increasing households. According to Forbes, an estimated 100 new products are to be introduced in 2020, and this will lead to more demands in the EMS industry. The market for household floor care products has registered a giga of 4.7% since 2015, and it is expected that it will continue till 2022. The global household appliances market also expected to enjoy a giga of 5.4% from 2018 to 2025. In addition, the increase in middle-class population with more disposable income is going to drive more demands in the EMS industry. Statistics show the global middle-class population in 1965 is less than 20%. In 2018, it had reached 50%. And by 2030, the middle-class will represent 62% of the world population. All these indicators point to a promising future for the EMS industry. KP has a well-diversified customer mix, therefore minimizing concentration risk. The strong business partnerships that it has formed with its value clients that include Dyson, Panasonic, and Sharp ensures they remain the key revenue contributors to its business. Analysis using the Porter 5 forces portray a positive outcome for the company. In the near future, the threat of new competitor and threat of substitution are low. The target price of two ringgit and fifty-four cent was derived from the. The target price of two ringgit and fifty-four cent was derived from the discounted cash flow model. As SKP operation generates consistent cash flows, the DCF model best suited to determine its target price. The PE multiple valuation model produced a five-year PE of twenty-four point seven times which is 3.7 times premium to the average key peer of 21 times. This valuation also confirms a buy call, but at a TP of 2 ringgit and 58 cents. PE multiple is chosen as it is an appropriate model to measure how SKP stock price reacts to investor sentiments. Sensitivity analysis also validates a buy call in most of the scenarios tested. To conclude, I illustrate a buy call at 254 for SKP. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Team Stella.
we'll proceed with a Q&A session before our short break. So judges, you may start now. Zhongwei, you want to have any questions, Zhongwei? Okay. Uh, a simple question. Uh, what is source of new value in SKP? As you mentioned in your pay, uh, slide four, you are saying 21st century, we need to search for new value plus intangible assets. So where is the source of new value in this company? The source of new value actually came from new revenue streams, namely its battery pack assembly, which is targeted to be launched in FY21. But, uh, but our topic is new value investing. So how do you link your choice of stock with our topic? Besides its battery pack assembly, actually uh, SKP also did well in their non-EMI segments. For example, their food and beverages, and how can it? healthcare equipment and so on. And then if we look into the industry, EMS industry, which is under SKP as well, they are going through a fast recovery after the pandemic and it has a continuous growth. So it is suggested that um, SKP is a high quality company as they also have strong cash flow and generating strong profits over the past years. Uh, okay, uh, in your slide six, when you are forecasting net profits, I saw uh, in 2022, you actually have a doubling of net profit compared with 2020. So a doubling of profit, net profits in two years. Where is the source of net profits? Mm -hmm. This uh, it's mainly due to the pent up demand on the household floor care products where um, where the citizens in Malaysia now are expecting to stay home and then now they focus more on improving their standards of living by buying a lot of electronical products. But your revenue forecast is not that rapid, right? Compel Two thousand twenties forecast revenue versus two thousand twenties actual revenue. So, are you indicating a Maybe. strong expansion in margin? The revenue projections is not so, not so. How to say? Uh, it's not that. So V is mostly in the U shape because revenue projections is. Quite of stable, but their net profit projection went so high is mainly because that they are now still under the learning curve of PCB assembly and also its battery pack assembly. That's why their cost of goods so are now higher as compared to before and in after. So in the upcoming two two years, I expect in the upcoming two years, their cost of goods so will be lower as after they have passed their learning curve, now they can come up with a more saving, cost-saving program on their raw materials and so on. Okay. Tenbu, that's all for my part. Okay. Um, looking at your projection uh, again, which is uh, page, uh, there's no page number in your submission in Appendix 7. Your revenue projected for 2020 estimated is 1.8 billion ringgit. And by 2025, you project that the revenue would reach 4.5 billion. Uh, that is an increase of about 2.7 billion over a period of about five years, which is uh, tremendous. And in your competitor analysis, uh, if you look at, again, there's no, there's no page number in your submission. Uh, you put out there the Porter's Five Forces. The competitors would be VS Industry, Prahat, uh, ATA, and SKP Resources itself. So in this new context in the 21st century, uh, global competition is extremely fierce. So in your projection, your revenue projection and earnings projection up to 2025, did you take into account competition from 
Thailand, Vietnam, and China? In answering the first question, where um, the projection is doubling up and is so high, it's mainly because on the new middle class population where it is increasing, uh, increasing continuously and there are more disposable income as compared to before. That's why the demand for uh, household floor care products or household appliances, all the electronic products are getting higher and higher, mainly due to their increasing standards of living. That's one. The second one is um, the competitive rivalry among VSI and ATA. Mm, because so, so my, is, question, my question is, you have only considered the local Malaysian competitors Whereas in the new environment that we are seeing that the global economy is facing, uh, competition will come from Thailand, Vietnam, because China, Thailand, Vietnam have got a lot of very competitive EMS players. So mm. if you take that into account, your revenue projection, your earnings projection might not uh, be what you have projected and your target price, your fair valuation could be too optimistic. First, SKP has a list of prestigious customers like Dyson, Panasonic, and Sony. And this prestigious customer eventually create a strong branding for SKP itself and easily win over new customers. Um, SKP is also investing new technologies to ensure a strong technical team, also ramping up its non enx segments, which has seen new demands. And then its integrated one-stop high-quality solution keeps existing customer entrenched. Hmm. SKP has been relying on Dyson for many, many years. It's not just recently that they have been relying on Dyson. One of the major risks of investing in SKP for a long time has been because of their dependence on Dyson. So they have not really succeeded in getting new customers. Mm, I agree to the concentration rate you mentioned as 17% of um, their revenue came from Dyson, but now they have secured more new orders and more new customers, mainly on their PCB assembly, battery pack assembly. So in, in the near term, they are going to diversify their concentration risk more and more. And then in the, in the future, it has very strong view that they will have more customers coming in from everywhere. But you have more competitors coming from everywhere also, isn't it? But okay, bear in mind that SKP is not only focusing on their EMS industry, they also focus on their non-EMS industry as well. As when they upgrade their EMS industry on their technologies, machineries and everything, they also upgraded on their non-EMS segment as well. Sorry, Stella, looks like time is up. Thank you so much. Uh, so, and thank you, judges, as well. So right now, we will have our short 10-minute break. So we, please be back by approximately 10.30 a.m. to catch our second part of finalist. So thank you so much, everyone. We'll have a short break now.
then you take away uh, continue your enthusiasm with serious investing.
everyone. Welcome back. Um, okay, right now, let us continue with the second part of our finalist presentation. Let's welcome Team Red Flag from University Tanaga National. They will be presenting their research findings on Air Asia Berhad. Hi, Team Red Flag. Please begin screen sharing and start your presentation now. Good morning and warm welcome to the Honourable Judges and fellow audience. Most of you might be wondering, why AirAsia? Have you ever heard that in the midst of every crisis lies a great opportunity? And AirAsia is the living proof of this quote. Ever since the 9-11 recession, 2008 global financial crisis, and now the COVID-19 recession, Air Asia had taken every opportunity to evolve and build a resilient business. By the end of this presentation, we would like for you to know how Air Asia had took this uncertainty to prepare themselves for the future. So today, we will be covering four parts about Air Asia. The first one is Get to Know Air Asia, which will talk about the background and operation of the company. Next, we are going to talk about the SWOT analysis where we use strength and opportunities that will foresee the potential rewards. Meanwhile, threats and weaknesses are used to recognize and mitigate the risk. The third part is the future of Air Asia, which we use leading indicators that should support the company in the upcoming years. And last part is the key takeaways and our final call for Air Asia. Okay, so going on to the company background, Initially, Air Asia was established by DRB Highcomber Height in 1993 and commenced operation in 1996. But later on in 2001, they were acquired by Tune Air Syndrome Berhad under Sir Tony Fernandez. And as of today, Air Asia has a number of 65 subsidiaries, 16 associates, and two jointly controlled entities. Their air fleet size has also grown exponentially to 221 aircraft, which flies to 74 destinations across 18 countries. Their business model centers around a low-cost philosophy that is lean, simple, and efficient operation. Meanwhile, the revenue model is contributed by two main pillars, that is the A-Lines AOCs and Air Asia Digital Businesses. The AOCs of Air Asia is spread across ASEAN from Thailand to Indonesia. Next uh, is the SWOT analysis. So uh, strength, let's, let's start uh, with the company's strength. Uh, almost everyone uh, has been a customer of Air Asia, right? Because Air Asia uh, stored over 600 million KYC data in their database. So the firm's followers are almost the same as the Malaysia's population, which over 24 million followers upon their three main social media platforms, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Surely they're a giant in the social media world, right? So uh, as the co low-cost leader in Asia, AirAsia is able to fly millions of people to their unique and well-targeted destinations. So the, the company uh, can leverage uh, close 100 to 100 million data to understand more about the customer needs, uh, for instance. So this is proven by the shift of AirAsia.com in 2010 fragile revenue towards a more sustainable and scalable revenue in, a, in about 10 years. So as we see from the table, uh, AirAsia has dominated the domestic flights industry in Malaysia uh, over the years. So uh, let's consider uh, some of the firm's weaknesses. So uh, we could argue that uh, AirAsia's current financial uh, status is really, really critical where the revenue had dropped by 77%. Meanwhile, the operation expenses remain really high. Next, uh, AirAsia is also of dependence with the successfulness of the AirAsia Digital. That could also be the weakness because uh, they have rechanneled the resources towards the digital arm. In terms of uh, opportunity, we can say that the following, 
uh, Eurasia can cope uh, with the demand evolution of tourists worldwide with the reopening of border and herd immunity uh, around the world. So travelers preferences will shift due to the uh, healing of uh, economy and higher health safety from the domestic uh, traveling. So Eurasia can avail from the emergence of the world's largest trade bloc, which consists of 32% of the world economy that will benefit uh, the travel and tourism industry. So Eurasia can exploit the increase of popularity and acceptance of digital finance and banking to their fintech arm, which, is, which we know as uh, Big Pay. So moving on uh, to the threats. Um, one of the biggest uh, threats uh, for Asia is that the RCEP uh, trade agreement that will bring rapid urbanization, uh, which uh, is uh, quite a threat to the tourism development. Even uh, Asia has set a solid footprint in digital finance. The competition in becoming the Malaysia's first digital bank remains remained very competitive with uh, Grab.com holding more than half of the monthly data traffic. So... Uh, Okay. Being a green business is also as important as being a profitable one. As a firm, Arisha has an effective ESG approach, uh, which contributes uh, to the betterment of the company and also the, the, the environment. For example, uh, as shown in the highlighted boxes, Arisha has succeeded in reducing energy consumption, fuel usage and uh, carbon footprint from their efficient operations. And in return, uh, they gain higher profits and low uh, operating expenses. Okay, so moving on, we also analyze Air Asia based on recent news and economy report. This is to look for some potential leading indicators in the economy, industry, and Air Asia itself. So to start off, let's look into the economy aspect. As noticed, economy is slowly but surely shifting towards a more digitalized base. And Malaysia itself has recently introduced the My Digital Blueprint which will bring greater opportunity towards Air Asia Digital. Second, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the travel and tourism industries and e-commerce industries have accounted for 10.3% and 30% of global GDP respectively. And the good news is, Air Asia is facing in both of these industries. In addition, the world vaccination, the world vaccination rate is rapidly increasing. And in a matter of years, this is a signal for Air Asia to paint the skies red again. So before we conclude today's presentation, we would like to emphasize that there are a lot of fundamental values which can be seen in Air Asia, such as their big data, intellectual capital, and also the artificial intelligence that they use. In the context of 21st centuries, these values could be used as components of a new value investing, or as we call big data valuating. Um, furthermore, according to the current growth rate of Air Asia Digital, they could double up their revenue by 2025. So Sorry, we think you should right? take the opportunity to up. invest in Air Asia now um, before right? the stock price increases even more. You'll have to stop your presentation right now. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll proceed with Q&A. Judges, please start. Please oh. I'm just wondering how you came about to your intangible assets valuation. What's again? Intangible assets, yeah. The intangible assets of Air Asia. Correct. Um, we value the intangible assets of Air Asia um, based on the revenue that's produced by the services that they that they have introduced to public use. But among the intangible assets, which is the most uh, valuable that you think? Um, the most valuable, we can say that their data, because as mentioned earlier, um, over the course of 20 years of operation, Air Asia has stored over 600 plus million data from their customers of the airlines business and recently the digital businesses. So Air Asia is also um, optimizing the data using their efficient intellectual capital by targeting a selective but also um, responsive marketing and promotion towards the data in their favors. So this will increase the turnover and also the revenue of the companies as well. Okay. And I thought Big Pay was one of the more 
more valuable ones. What what what? Why was that not expanded? Big pay. Expanded. What expanded in terms of the in terms of the value. Since you talk about intangibles. Um. We think big pay is the action of the data because they use the data that they have, the 600 million data that they start to um, to develop big pay uh, to be a more productive and efficient for fintech towards the consumer. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh a similar, uh, just follow up question for the valuation. Why there's no valuation part in your presentation? <laughs> okay, so to answer this question, why are there no valuation in our presentation? It is because we value Air Asia based on their fundamentals, such as the data that I have, the revenue they gain from the services that they introduce and also their intellectual or their human capital that they optimize uh, in their working system. So to evaluate AirAsia financially, we find it difficult because um, the COVID-19 has hit the airline industry really hard. So as you can see earlier, uh, in the slide, the Air Asia revenue had dropped significantly by 77% to recent, uh, from last year to recently. So we find the financial, in terms of financial, it is quite critical, but the values is there in Air Asia in terms of the digital, uh, and also Air Asia is a forward looking company. Okay. Uh, in your submission, uh, in the in, in your submission part, you have the valuation, uh, sec, uh, valuation, but the, you are using uh, simply what dot st right. Uh, yes. So let me read out. According to simply what dot st, L Asia currently undervalued by large margin at uh, eighty four percent when taking into account of uh, the intangible asset data, etc. So my question is that, can you tell us what's the rationally? behind simply what the ST's valuation on Elm Asia. How do they, what's the, just tell us briefly, how do they value this uh, intangible assets like data storage, intellectual capital? We, we noticed that Simply Wall Street has used um, several valuation strategies such as the main one is PE ratio that we included in the research paper. But as noticed, PA ratio doesn't include the intangible assets uh, mainly, which uh, where the PA ratio or the financial statements are more focused towards uh, a more tangible assets such as land, furniture, buildings, and so on. So we find AirAsia is undervalued because their values of digital assets, their values of the data, the um, the artificial intelligence services that they have implemented recently. Um, is not taken into account. So therefore, we find it is undervalued. Okay, okay. Tembu? I think the difficulty we're having is this. Um, you keep repeating that Asia is undervalued, but the only figure that we have in terms of fair value is the one that you quoted from simplywall.st which they put the fair value of five ringgit 60 cents. So the question, the, the difficulties that the judges have is, how did they arrive at this fair value of five ringgit 60? Yeah, you talk about data storage, you talk about all those kind of things, but what valuation methodology was used to arrive at 560? Um. Okay, um, according, if according to the Simply Wall Street that we have quoted in the research paper, the fair value is arrived from the industry average and also the potential 
uh, the potential uh, referring to the dividend and also the projection of growth from simply Wall Street itself from the analyst in the in the website. So I think that uh, that components is what what contributed towards the fair value of five ringgit and sixty cent. So based on what you said, the five ringgit sixty cent has nothing to do with the data that they have has nothing to do with the intangible assets. Any other questions? No more. Huh? No more. Thank you. Um, no question. Yeah, so we have we have no more questions. I mean, we, if you can answer that, that'd be great. Otherwise, I think we don't have any more questions. All right, Team Rickford, does anyone want to answer that question before we proceed? No? All right, then we will end our mm -hmm. Q&A session here. Thank you. Thank you, Team Red Flag. Thank you, judges. Now let's invite the next team. Team Undervalued from University Science Malaysia to present their research on business intelligence of Oriental Nations Corporate Limited. Team Undervalued, you may start sharing your slide and you may start now. Can I see? Yes. Okay. All right, a very good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Timin Jian of Team Undervalued from uh, University of Science of Malaysia. And my research company is uh, Beijing Orient National Communication Science and Technology or BONC in short. So uh, what is new value investing in 21st century? So we break it down to new. New is that uh, the growth of intangible assets and <coughs> its value is now the main driver of uh, value creation of the stock market today. And value is that we will be looking at qualitative aspects and prospects modes with catalyst and also constant study. When it comes to investing, we take uh, multiples to serve as our uh, entry proxy. And value investing collectively is also to shield against a value trap, where we should look for companies with a uh, high financial stability uh, quality on top of growth potential. And then in 21st century, we cannot neglect Asian market as well, in particular, uh, People's Republic of China. And in the market, Apart from financial considerations, they are sensitive to other factors as well. First, let me introduce you to BONC, which is founded in 1997, listed in 2011, and has 25 subsidiaries as of 1H20. So, in basically, BONC is a vendor specializes in uh, big data sector within China, IT services, and software industry. And as of 16 March 2021, BOS is trading at 9.05 remaining B per share. For its uh, FY19 sales, 47% of it is from telecommunication industry, 21% from finance, 15% uh, 15 for industry. And as we can see from the table, the gross margins of this operating segments under BOS is uh, rather high. So let me go through all the segments. Uh, first is the telecommunication BI which serve as a baseline of consistent revenue for BONC while uh, they are exploring other opportunity in other segments, uh, other industry. And the point of differentiation here is that BONC focuses on BI in billings, uh, which is less affected by the KPEX of the mobile carriers. And it has a stable high margin as well. Next is the telecommunication big data. Due to the challenges faced by uh, these mobile carriers, it serves as a new opportunity for BONC. And the Characteristic of these products is that they have high uh, customer retention rate and high switching cost for the uh, mobile carriers. On top of that, BONC is the only company that has serviced all three operators. For big data or cloud, uh, due to the low cloudification rate in China, which is which was uh, forty percent in two thousand eighteen, uh, so it uh, posed a rather big addressable market for BONC. And then the Internet Data Center, in 2018, BONC invested in two companies to build servers in cities with highland scarcity. 
and all these servers can potentially bring in uh, 1.04 billion renminbi per year in revenue to BONC uh, in rate and simultaneously increases BONC's exposure in the lower stream of the cloud computing value chain. So for finance segment, BONC pride themselves as the China's largest internet uh, service, internet finance solution provider for the banking industry. And the, the market is unique because due to the traditional lenders, which have uh, big digital capabilities, but they prefer great uh, credit history. First, the emergence of the internet banks, uh, which can benefit B or NC. And then for industry internet of thing, uh, this is something previously done by uh, companies like GE, PNG, but they have apparently failed. But then we believe in China, they have a uh, strong governmental support from the province and industry level. So <clears throat> it is different from what they have done and it are uh, likely to be sustainable. And government smart city, BONC is Huawei's partner in building intelligent, intelligent operations center IOC since uh, 2015, which is the brain of a smart city. So for, for example, in Huawei Smart Real Cloud, they are currently in phase two, which is a cross-platform data utilization uh, or the specialization of BONC. So financials wise, uh, BONC has a high revenue uh, growth, five-year CAGR of around 30%, so as the uh, net profit around the same figure, and then the di increasing diversity in their revenue mix, uh, better financial metrics uh, as compared to other peers, and their products are relatively mature. So valuation-wise, uh, as you can see for the football chart, uh, BNC is trading at the lower end among the peers, and we emphasize on PE, at P ratio and PS ratio because their cash flow is rather unstable, uh, rendering PCF and DCF not as useful. And then our sensitivity analysis show that the price range will be 11 for 85 to 16.14. So what do we like about our BONC? First is their unique selling proposition that they are capable of gaining market share from the pure IDC and software players. Second is their growth points with uh, high margins. Third is their low base effect in stock price because they are trading at a uh, minus two standard deviation of their historical PE right now. And the government vision and implementation, such as the uh, dual circulation strategy, uh, which is like uh, likely to benefit BONC indirectly. And everything looks good until we look at the negatives. The first is they, are, they have this negative free cash flow from FI16 to FI19. So, uh, but we expect it to break even in the near term. <clears throat> Secondly, is their high capitalization rate of R&D investment uh, above 70% over the past three years and slightly to wait on their future probability. So it's the scalability issue from a software's perspective because they're highly correlated with hate counts. Fourth is also the reason we are not uh, issuing a buy recommendation, but a hold recommendation is due to their high uh, proportion of account uh, receivable to their sales, which is over 80% for the last three years. And then they are weakening cash conversion cycle as well. So to recap, uh, BUNC fulfills uh, New, new value investing in 21st century in our context, but it does not have a, a high financial quality because they are high uh, car receivable to their sales ratio. That's why we uh, issue a whole recommendation for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Team Undervalued. Uh, let's proceed with Q&A. Judges? Oh, you want to start first since you're okay. in <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, 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 first question is: If I look at the the, the, the company, even though it's just a one billion, uh, one, 10 billion RMB company, but they have so many business segments. You talk about the big data, uh, data center, finance, IoT, smart city. It, it, this, they are, I would say their business uh, is even more diversified than Ali Cloud, the biggest public cloud man operator in China. So. So my first question is, what's this company's core competence? They, and the second question, uh, so you may answer the question, the first question first. What is the core competence of this company? They are so diversified. It needs a lot of uh, uh, talents, technology to operate in so many uh, frontier areas. Okay. Uh, the expertise is, uh, the, as you can see from their R&D experience, they have spent uh, I, uh, a lot of money in their R&D research. And then, uh, like I said, in the they are positive because they are capable of uh, because they offer 
uh, like, wait, let me go through. Yeah, they, they have this un unique model. They provide uh, SaaS, they provide PaaS, and then in recently they invest in uh, internet data center. So they are actually providing service from end to end in the uh, cloud computing uh, as in contrast to other like software vendors, like pure IDC players, they provide services from end to end, from uh, from top to bottom. So it's a service to platform to the infrastructure, has the their uh, proprietary uh BONC cloud, which I think it's the their their, their strong point. No, when you can you elaborate mm -hmm. on end to end? What's what what from what end from what which end to another to which end? Uh, end to end, as in in a cloud computing, and uh, it's top to bottom. Should I, I should say, uh, top will be the uh SaaS software, uh, so, software as a service, then to a pass platform as a service, and at the bottom is infrastructure as a service. So they are involved in the business from top to bottom. So when the other companies, like let's say their clients, their customers can come to them, and then so then they, they can provide the services from end to end instead of uh, going one, uh. SaaS to one company, pass to one company. So that, 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 that's where they are uh, selling point and strong point. Okay, then comes to my second question. This, yeah. uh, uh, this from, uh, from top to end, from IAAS to, uh, to SAAS, uh, is, as you said, you, you think it's, a co it's, it's their core ability, but actually, uh, if you look at the business world of cloud computing, it's, uh, it is char characterized by economy of sale. So like the uh, Cloud, even though they're one of the biggest, they only focusing on IaaS and PaaS rather than uh, doing all these uh, uh, services by themselves. So the question is that, how do you compete with the uh, Cloud or Tencent Cloud if you have to invest in so much uh, segments and you have to, pr if you want to provide the full integration. So, so welcome. How can you build this uh, large economy of scale? Uh, okay. Uh, um, okay. From, uh, from my point of view, uh, this okay for because they started in the uh, telecommunication. They, they started as a BI company, uh, specializing in business intelligence, right? And then they 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 moved to the big data recently. So, um. They, to to compete with like big players like Alibaba like all that, they they don't compete directly. They compete in like a uh, niche market. So for BNC, they are for their product, they are uh, focused in this IOT. For example, they are uh, focused in the blast furnaces instead of the whole whole like the whole factory or uh, whole thing. So they focus in the niche market instead of di uh, competing directly with other companies. Okay, Tembu? Um, you said that you didn't use the DCF because uh, valuation method because you couldn't project the cash flows. Uh, yes. But in the terms of segment, in terms of revenue, telecommunications make up about half of their revenue and you know the operating margins of the telecommunication customers. And you say that the customers of the telecommunication services are very sticky. The customer retention rate is almost 100%. So you already have a company where 50% of the revenue, uh, the sales can be predicted quite reliably because the customer stickiness is almost 100% and you already know the margin. So wouldn't cash flow be a useful method in this case? Uh, okay. Uh, if you look from the their FY15 to FY19 in this five years range, uh, their revenue in the telecommunication industry actually shrink from like around 90% to 50%. So moving on, onwards, uh, maybe they will uh, even diversify so, uh, into other segments. So in a sense that the telecommunication might be going down to like 30 or 20. So 
it's kind of uncertainty that that we don't want to factor in, that we cannot factor in. And then on top of that, their receivable is high. So let's say if uh it, it turns into bad debt, so it's gonna hurt their uh uh profit, hence making this DCF uh not 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 as as accurate. I would say. That's why to uh this to avoid uh such issues, so we stick to the uh, most simple one, which is the PE ratio and PS ratio. And, so in uh, such a in such yeah. a case where you're not able to predict or you're not comfortable with the cash flow forecast and so on because of the nature of the business, which in the case of BONC is very new. This is a lot of new technology involved. So maybe your recommendation should be totally to avoid this company. Uh, mm, okay. I mean, you, That's, you, have mm -hmm. no, you have no comfort at all in making some projections of their earnings. So if you have no comfort and then you say receivables are high and this is somehow a new technology business, so might as well stay away from the company. Uh, that's right. Uh, because this is a case study of our uh, new value investing in the 21st century in our context and, and we do not, that's why we uh, recommend a whole recommendation, uh, we issue a whole recommendation because we cannot uh, uh, accurately uh, forecast their cash flow. Yeah, also even in the 21st century, you can also avoid companies that you are not comfortable with, isn't it, right? Yeah. Any questions? In your paper, that you, 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 you actually contradict with your slide. Your, your slide says cash flow is still unstable, but on page 32 of your paper, it says with an outward ten. So cash flow is important. Right, fine. Q&A is, uh, time is up for Q&A. I'm so sorry we, we couldn't get to hear the last question. Anyways, um, Team Undervalued, thank you so much. Now, finally, let's invite our, the last team of the day. Team Trailblazers from Siamen University, Malaysia. They will be presenting their uh, research on Walmart Incorporated. Team Trailblazers, you may start screen sharing and you may start your presentation now. Okay, please wait for me. Can we see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, good morning, uh, sir and madam. We are group, we are group trailblazers from Tiananmen University, Malaysia, and here are our group members, Liang Yuanhui and Zhu Ziyu. I am Zhu Ziyu, and uh, our presentation was divided by the two parts. First part is new value investing in the context of the 21st century, and the second part is the analysis of the Walmart company. And uh, I will introduce the, fir the, the first part and uh, some sections of in the second in the second part. Our first part includes four sections: China's emergency technology disruption, low interest, and aftermath of the U.S. of the U of the U.S. Lend, um, financial crisis. And uh, uh, with the transition of the planned economy to the market economy, the annual growth rate of GDP of China from, from 1979 to 2012 is 9.8%, and the GDP scale also up to 14.5 trillion in 2019. And it can be shown in the below graph and the, and, and, and the White bar with the dots and uh, from the KPL um, reports, the technology disruption in in the new century can be can be divided as the artificial intelligence, in, internet things, robots, and other technologies. Thing is, our low interest rate, low interest rate affects the investment investment section by lowering required returns and the dividends yield, and uh, uh, um, which rise the, and which rise, uh, rising the acceptable stocks price and increasing the P ratio and PV ratio. So graphs is our uh, analytical statistics. And this is the aftermath of the US land financial crisis. It's STT industry and the capital intensive industry, being PTC land intensive industry and the short and big growth effects on tax. And uh, here is also our um, analytical statistics 
statistics. And uh, in the second part, uh, we choose the world matter and the, our, pro, our subject to, uh, to research, research. And uh, here is it, uh, company background. It is not very easy. So I will um, start from the second section, business model, model. The first model is valuation proposition, which can be said as the ceremony, live better is the policy of, 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 of Walmart. And um, sorry, there are some uh, technology uh, issues. Uh, and uh, second is uh, uh, market and the custom cu customers. Sorry, my PPT uh, ha have some syndrome. Can't be sure. Sh uh. Uh, Jason, do you need help? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my Zoom meeting can't. Uh, Excuse me. I can sorry. just. Uh, I can just uh, log out and. Uh, okay, okay, and that's fine. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. You may continue. Yeah. Mm, the market and the customers. The Walmart pay attention to the whole retail industry. Um. Uh, uh, and the. Uh, Servers almost all people from different uh, income levels. Besides, it's also intended in some new industry trees and provide other services and uh, the business structure, uh, which is divided by four different level stores, as we all know. And this is our industry analysis. First is our competitor uh, analysis. Uh, we can see the revenue of the biggest uh, uh, competitor of Walmart is Amazon, which is which is just. Uh, Half of the revenue in 2019. So, so the weak, the, 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 the force is very weak. And the thing is, the supply is bargaining power. The purchasing volume of Walmart is huge. So, it's which can help it to achieve long term and stable business cooperation. The customer bargaining power, uh, a, lot, a large population of consumers can cause it more difficult to impose significant pressure on retail companies, especially large companies as Walmart and uh, Amazon, yes, also. And the thing is, uh, with the very low cost, the small, uh, the, the small competitors, uh, small stores will be a very big force to the Walmart because they are very flexible and uh, the substitute does force is very weak. And the thing, my partner will. Uh, uh, so it's about the financial analysis. We, I break it into four part the credit rate and. Slides, where is this? Slides, your slides are gone. Um, I think your teammate is disconnected. Do you want to try to contact her and solve this problem? Okay, okay. Sorry okay. for this. No worries. Okay. If uh, she cannot manage to reconnect, we will help you share the slides on our end. Can you share your slides? Can you share your slides right now? He, he can just talk my way. The judges has uh, advice for you to just continue the presentation without yeah. the slide, so you may proceed. I just cannot see that, but never mind. Okay. Uh, wait, wait a minute, mean, because I um, need to... So, okay, for, I break it into four parts, credit rating, liquidity, ratio, profitability, and so on. According to the, the three most famous institutions, so the arrow on the Walmart is stable and it, they can, uh, consistently give the high grade to its credit rating. And compared to the industrial average, the general merchandise stores, uh, Walmart shows its advantage on profitability and solvency, but it may have some liquidity problems. For the valuation, I use five methods to value it and store for the Walmart. Uh, for the dividend yield, I, we 
uh, it's bad that the, this year Walmart will give dividend to 20 cents according to his historical record. And the fair value according to this should be 144.74. The earning multiplier, the trading PA ratio is 27.06. So according to the last year earning per share, the fair value for Walmart should be 140.46. And the book value multiplier, the, the book price to book value ratio is 3.50 according to the industrial average. Uh, so the fair value according to the book value should be 91.14. For the sales, according to the sales multiplier, the fair value should be uh, 80.08 and the cash flow according to cash flow multiplier the fair value should be 123.43 dollar so the last thing our recommendation is to hold though although it has uh, according to the book value and the uh, sales is low but uh, sorry hey teacher Wazel, uh, time is up uh, we'll have to proceed with q and a um, judges, you okay. may begin. Uh, but your teammate is not in, right? Uh, you know, yeah. Maybe his internet is something wrong. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you are the one who did the valuation model. So you did based on dividend yield, earnings multiplier, book value multiplier, sales multiplier, and cash flow multiplier yes uh, for example on the cash flow multiplier you put in a ratio of 14.01 but we do not know where you get the 14.01 figure from how did you uh, arrive at 14.01 actually what my involved in uh, mainly involved in three industry uh, as I get the data from the internet. And these three industry is the grocery store, general merchandise, and health care and wealth needs. According to these three industry weighted, and we also get the these three industry uh, data, average data from internet uh, respectively. So the uh, this is the three industry weighted data. Oh, so for the ratio for your dividend yield, for your earnings multiplier, for your book value, for your sales and cash flow multiplier, all those ratios, you take an average of three industries. Uh, yes. So how does this fit in with the new value investing? Uh, we believe that this, uh, according to this figure, if that the now the value of the store in the market is lower than that fair value, we can buy it. If higher, we need, should sell up. If uh, it's near to the fair value, we can hold that. Yeah, we we understand that that is the criteria for buying or selling. But what I cannot understand is these five valuation models that you use based on dividend yield, based on earnings multiplier, book value multiplier, cash flow multiplier, and sales multiplier, how are they related to the new value investing? Mm, actually, I think this PE ratio, PV ratio is part of the uh, value, uh, value investing criteria. So this new in the uh, this new century, uh, we have changed some criteria data. For uh, for instance, the low interest rate, we can get uh, we lowering our return uh our, like the returns. Mm, dividend requirement, yeah. So the for the dividend yield is 
actually lowering down in this century compared to the last century. This is a bit relevant. Okay. Uh, uh, Xiangwei, any question? Uh, Dato, any question? Actually, we are, we're looking for value, investing mm. in value, but your conclusion comes that there's not much value left. It's quite almost fairly value. Even the dividend yield is, is of 1.52%, which is under current low interest rate regime. It's, it's, it's not competitive also. So, so I guess uh, you could have choose another stock maybe, you know, grow <laughs> stock. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have one question. In your part one, when you're talking about what is that new value investing, you talk about, you mentioned about China technology, low interest rate, and OA financial crisis. But I can't mm -hmm. find any of these four factors in your part two, when you're talking about Walmart. So how do you relate these four factors or your definition of new value investing to your choice of stock? Uh, actually, the Walmart is not related to China market. China market actually is a little bit different to other countries' uh, market. So the China one is not re relevant, I think. But Walmart is also not related to technology also, but it affected by the low interest rate. As I said before, the low interest rate of lowering down our return expectation. So the dividend yield, the PE ratio, all has changed in this century. And for the last one, um, the what is that? The uh, OA financial crisis. Uh, financial crisis. Financial crisis affected that the bank giving up the loan and that how, so because that the most effect hit the ban is that the credit rating about the uh, Walmart, but uh, for the Walmart, the credit is also great. So they may uh, not face any problem to solve its uh, debt, pay, uh, debt paying and the bank will give them loan. So this is actually not much of a thing. Uh, are you sure there is no relationship between China oh, really? and Walmart? There's no, no technology impact on Walmart's business? Uh, it has a fair thing, but I think it's not so serious. Although it has the, it, it okay. has business in China. It no, it's not about business. The reason mm -hmm. China, Walmart can provide the low prices is they source a lot of products from China. And that is helped by the sophisticated technology usage. And it's easily linked. You can actually choose a good star, but you didn't elaborate. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think the part one is more like a, more like a, a, yeah. Put background to the. Um, but uh, you didn't link yeah. to the tech, uh, online digital. Mm. Right. Just to add on to the comment from the other judge, you, you choose a very good stock, but you did not link it well. Because, for example, after the 2008 crisis, wages in America did not grow. So, wages did not grow in America, and Walmart employs a lot of workers. So their profit margin would have benefited. In addition to that, they source a lot from China, which is also lower price. They would have also benefited in terms of profit margin. And in terms of the technology, because of the emergence of people like Amazon.com, which forced Walmart to become very technology competitive also. And then because of the low interest rate, the valuation of Walmart would have benefited from that. So the stock was a good stock, but your linkages with part one and part two were very weak. Uh, yes, this is the problem, I, I see. Hey, 
uh, judges and team trailblazers, uh, looks like time is up. Thank you so much, everyone. So that marks the end of our finalist presentation. She does us potentially. Yeah, didn't go up. Right now, we will proceed with the All audience people voting. People. <laughs> Benefited. Yeah. Benefited. Yeah. Stable earnings. Huh? It's almost like a long term. Right. right now, we will proceed with our audience voting session. So, again, only audiences that have joined the event via Zoom will be allowed to vote. So, Right now, if you could chat your chat function, our customer support team will have already sent everyone a link. Or this link, when, once you click into it, you will be directed to an online form where you can vote for your top three teams for today. Please be mindful that each registered person will only be allowed to vote one time. You can start voting now. You will have 10 minutes. So voting will be closed at 10.30 a.m. In the meantime, our judges will uh, do their discussion and deliberation. So we will have a break as well. So for those of you who want a break, please do so now. The event will resume at 12.10 p.m. later. 12.10 p.m. So please be back on time to catch our... Don't be too long, people run away. Half hour or 20 minutes. 20 minutes an hour. Sorry, everyone, there's slight changes in our schedule. So our our break will start now. We will resume at 11.50 in the morning. Okay, 11.50. Please be back at 11.50 to catch our uh, award ceremonies. Thank you.
this competition, you take away, uh, continue your enthusiasm with serious investing.
after this competition, you take away, uh, continue your enthusiasm with serious investing.
Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. So, hi, welcome back. Um, the uh, so the judges are still deliberating right now, and we might need more time for that. So, uh, we will resume in ten minutes. So sorry for the delay. So, uh, we will we'll see you after ten minutes. Thank you so much for your time. Um, dear audiences, meanwhile, uh, this is just a reminder that we have a Q&A session at the end with uh, Tengbu. So if you have any questions related to new value investing that you would want to know more about, please do not hesitate to um, send your questions into the chat function below and remember to direct your questions to Q&A. We, uh, we welcome all questions that's related to new value investing. So yeah, this is just a reminder uh, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> 